PlayStation's Spectral Super Resolution PSSR? It's Sony's AI-driven upscaling technology designed to enhance game visuals by rendering at lower resolutions and then upscaling them to achieve sharper images without compromising performance. This approach is similar to NVIDIA's DLSS and AMD's FSR, aiming to deliver high-quality graphics with improved frame rates. However, not everyone is thrilled about PSSR. Some gamers are calling for its removal from the PS5 Pro, citing issues like minimal visual improvements and potential graphical glitches. For instance, games like Star Wars Jedi Survivor and the Silent Hill 2 remake have experienced graphic issues attributed to PSSR, leading to user complaints and developers acknowledging the need for fixes. Additionally, there's concern that PSSR's enhancements are subtle and may not justify the PS5 Pro's higher price point. At NVIDIA, we've been working hard to bring neural rendering to the next level. And today, I'm here to tell you about our latest breakthrough in real-time graphics, DLSS 3. So here's the deal with NVIDIA's DLSS. It's one of those tech stories where they started with a great idea, totally fumbled the execution at first, but then somehow turned it into something incredible. DLSS, or Deep Learning Super Sampling, was first introduced back in 2018 alongside NVIDIA's RTX 20 series graphics cards. The whole idea was to use AI to upscale a lower resolution image into a higher resolution one in real time. That way, you could get better performance without sacrificing visual quality, at least in theory. It was meant to offset the massive performance hit that came with ray tracing, which was also a brand new thing at the time. But when DLSS first dropped, it was kind of a mess. The visuals were blurry, the image looked worse than just running the game at native resolution, and only a few games even supported it. When it worked, it wasn't consistent, and it felt more like a cool tech demo than something practical. Gamers weren't buying the hype, and a lot of people saw it as NVIDIA trying to push something that wasn't ready. Fast forward a couple of years, though, and that's when things got interesting. NVIDIA released DLSS 2.0 in 2020, and it was a massive improvement. Suddenly, the visuals looked sharper, sometimes even better than native resolution, and the performance boost was real. They also made it easier for game developers to implement DLSS, so it started popping up in more games. That's when people stopped rolling their eyes at DLSS and started paying attention. These days, with DLSS 3 and all the updates they've rolled out, it's actually a huge deal. They've even added frame generation, which uses AI to create new frames between the ones your GPU renders, giving you even smoother gameplay. Sure, it's not perfect. Frame generation can add a bit of latency, which might not be great for competitive gaming. But for single-player games or visually intense stuff, it's a game changer. What's cool about the whole story is how it went from being this overhyped, underwhelming feature to something that's become a pretty big deal in gaming. It's a reminder that sometimes it takes a couple of tries to get things right. Honestly, it's kind of wild how far DLSS has come. The internet loves its drama. Again, people have asked me to talk about PSSR issues. I covered this last week and again today, but people still take things out of context. I've used the Pro myself and heard from a lot of you. Most PS5 Pro owners seem really happy. Sure, there are a few exceptions and some real concerns, but it's not right to call the PS5 Pro a beta device just because Unreal Engine 5 isn't living up to the hype and because some developers are more focused on getting their stores working than making the games run better. This is why I love PS5's own games. They just work, no fuss. And a quick side note, I don't know what Insomniac did with Spider-Man 2 recently, but it's running better than ever on the basic PS5 in performance mode, making all those Unreal Engine 5 games look bad. Horizon Forbidden West might not be the best game I've ever played, but it still blows my mind how good it looks on the basic PS5. So when I hear, that games like Alan Wake 2 and the Silent Hill 2 remake aren't doing well, and they aren't even big open world games, they're just simple walking simulators with issues on the PS5 Pro? Unreal Engine 5, despite its advancements and stunning visual capabilities, appears to have challenges when it comes to optimizing open world games. The primary issue seems to stem from its high demand on hardware resources, particularly in rendering detailed environments and maintaining smooth gameplay across expansive areas. Firstly, Unreal Engine 5 introduces technologies like Lumen and Nanite, which are designed to enhance lighting and provide highly detailed geometric precision. While these features are groundbreaking, they require significant processing power. 
In open world settings, where players expect a seamless transition between vast, densely packed landscapes, this can lead to performance issues such as frame rate drops and longer loading times, especially on mid-range hardware. Moreover, open world games rely heavily on dynamic elements, like changing weather systems, day-night cycles, and spontaneous events, all of which need to be processed in real time. Unreal Engine 5's focus on high-fidelity visuals can sometimes compromise these dynamic elements, affecting the fluidity and responsiveness that are crucial for an immersive open-world experience. Developers also face challenges in balancing visual fidelity with performance. I want you to pay close attention to this. Here's a very interesting quote from a game developer with seven years of experience. It's thought-provoking and, honestly, a bit shocking. Learning to use a program as ridiculously overcomplicated as Unreal Engine takes time, a lot of it. And while it's undeniably amazing to see the power of in-house engines brought to the public, what we've gotten in return is an oversaturated market of games that, frankly, feel uninspired. Don't get me wrong, I love Unreal Engine. I really do. It's the tool that pays my bills and keeps my career afloat. But that doesn't mean I don't have my gripes with it. With the release of Unreal Engine 5, you've probably seen a flood of game trailers for titles slated to release in the next year or two. And maybe it's just me, but a lot of these games look bland. My coworkers and I have started calling it the Unreal Engine look. It's hard to describe, but there's this sameness, a visual monotony that seems to crop up again and again. The depth of field, the hair rendering, the foliage, the particle effects. Oh, don't even get me started on those. It's all technically impressive, sure, but it's like every game made in Unreal is blending into the same semi-realistic, uncanny aesthetic. Now, maybe this bothers me more than most because I spend 10 plus hours a day working in Unreal Engine. I'm hyper aware of all its quirks and imperfections. But so many of these games feel like they lack personality, like asset flips dressed up in photorealism. And while I wouldn't say Unreal is solely to blame, it plays a big role in this. Unreal Engine is a fantastic tool when used right. Look at what Square Enix achieved with Final Fantasy VII Remake or what indie studios did with Stray. Those are shining examples of how the engine can be pushed to create visually stunning, unique experiences. But those projects have one thing many other developers don't, massive budgets or laser-focused artistic direction. For smaller studios, Unreal can become a crutch. It promises easy photorealism, but that ease comes at a cost, originality. Instead of creating distinct visual identities, many teams end up defaulting to Unreal's built-in tools and presets. And as much as I hate to admit it, Unity doesn't suffer from this problem in quite the same way. Unity's more open-ended approach allows for more visual diversity, even if that means its games sometimes look rougher around the edges. Here's the harsh truth. Unreal Engine, especially with recent updates, is becoming less indie-friendly. It's transforming into a tool best suited for large studios with the resources to overcome its inherent limitations. For smaller teams, those limitations can feel like a trap, an engine that promises creative freedom, but often delivers generic results unless you have the budget to break out of its mold. I don't want to see Unreal fall into irrelevance or become the engine people roll their eyes at. I've been using it for seven years, and it's made me the designer I am today. But it's not perfect, and I think the industry needs to have these conversations about the oversaturation of games that look the same, about the challenges smaller teams face when using these tools, and about how we can all push for more diversity and innovation in game design. Variety has a great article breaking down some big moves and insights from PlayStation leaders Herman Holst and Hideaki Nishino. Definitely worth a read if you're interested in where Sony is heading. First off, it's a bit of a turbulent time for PlayStation. Earlier this year, there were over 200 layoffs at Bungie, one of their key studios, and they recently shut down Concord, a live service game that barely made it a month after launching in August. PlayStation also closed down two studios behind the game, Firewalk, which developed Concord, and Neon Koi, their mobile-focused brand. And fans had some complaints about the PS5 Pro, but it's not all bad news. PlayStation has had some recent successes too. Their new platformer, Astrobot, is getting a lot of praise, and fans are really excited about Ghost of Yote, the upcoming sequel to Ghost of Tsushima. Plus, with the HBO series The Last of Us coming back for a second season and Amazon working on a God of War series, Sony has a lot of buzz around its franchises beyond just the games. Holst and Nishino have adopted a show-don't-tell approach to leading PlayStation. Holst says, It's important we convey our strategy, 
But at the end of the day, I am with the creators a big chunk of time, Nishino added. To me, the product, the content, it should be the forward-facing things. Behind the scenes, who is the guy doing it? It doesn't matter. This low-profile leadership style seems to align with their belief that the games themselves should do most of the talking. There's also some interesting talk about the PS5 Pro. Nishino shared that Sony actually started working on the PS5 Pro before the PS5 even launched. They learned from their experience with the PS4 Pro, where about 20% of PS4 owners chose the higher-end version. Nishino explained Sony's vision, saying, there are technologies we can grow up in three years' time or five years' time, so the innovation and technology advancement is more quicker in a modern world. He also made it clear that the PS5 Pro isn't the next-gen console. It's an upgrade within the PS5 generation for those who want a more high-end experience. Holst also talked about how their game studios love working with new hardware and are often involved early on in designing it. He said, the teams love tinkering with the hardware. It's very much that symbiosis of on the the hardware side. What can you guys do with it? And here's the feedback. This close collaboration helps set a high quality standard for PlayStation's exclusives and inspires third-party developers to make the most of the hardware, too. When asked about their approach to adapting games into other media, like TV shows, Holst explained how The Last of Us HBO series taught them a lot. He said, We learned a lot. It's really important to involve the original creators to ensure that your experience remains very authentic. They're planning to be even more careful with these adaptations, aiming for meticulous franchise management, so we can probably expect more well-made adaptations in the future. Pulse did acknowledge the recent layoffs, saying, it's our duty to look at our resource planning and make sure that we run a sustainable business. But it's also important to realize that on the content side, PlayStation Studios is now a much bigger organization than when it started. While there have been cuts, he also pointed out that the company has grown a lot in recent years, both through hiring and acquisitions. If you're into gaming or just curious about PlayStation's future, definitely check out Variety's article for the full story. It dives into the thought process behind a lot of these moves and gives some good insight into where the company's headed. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get into our final game, I almost killed the PlayStation brand with the live service model. If we're looking at this generation, the first two years barely count, right? The pandemic threw a massive wrench into everything, like a storm that grounded the gaming industry for a while. Game development slowed to a crawl and first party exclusives? Almost non-existent for a good stretch. So yeah, it feels like we're being asked to move on before we've really settled into the PlayStation 5 era. But calling this generation a total disaster? Let's pump the brakes. That's a bit like saying your favorite team is hopeless just because they lost a few matches. The Concord catastrophe. Yes, it was a spectacular failure. Launching a live service game that fizzles out in two weeks is like a rocket that never makes it out of the atmosphere. It's embarrassing, no doubt. But here's the thing. One failed experiment doesn't define the entire brand. It's like burning one dish in a Michelin star kitchen. It's bad, but it doesn't mean the chef forgot how to cook. And while Concord is a cautionary tale, let's not ignore the bigger picture. 2024 is shaping up to be a banner year for PlayStation. They've got momentum, strong releases, and fans are starting to see the kind of games that remind us why we love this platform. Now let's talk about Jim Ryan, the guy at the center of a lot of this drama. There's a popular theory, and it's believable, that he pushed all of Sony's first party studios to prioritize live service games. He wanted 12 of them by 2026, as if success could be mass-produced like assembly line cars. But here's the catch. Sony's magic has never been in chasing trends. They've thrived by creating immersive, story-driven, single-player experiences that stick with you for years. Trying to shoehorn them into the live service model was like asking a painter to mass-produce memes. It's not what they do best. And then, poof, Ryan's out, and the narrative shifts. People are speculating that Sony is quietly pivoting back to their bread and butter, those rich, single-player games we all love. Whether or not this theory is 100% accurate doesn't matter as much as what's happening in real time. These shifts take years to play out. You can't steer a ship this massive in an instant. But if the direction is right, it's worth the wait. Let's also give credit where it's due. Ryan's departure feels like the PlayStation brand exhaling after holding its breath. Did his vision hurt the company's momentum? A little? Yeah. But did it ruin the brand? Not even close. 
If anything, it's like hitting a speed bump on a long road trip. You feel it, but it doesn't stop the journey. Now, about the PlayStation 6. I'll admit it feels fast, almost like announcing dessert before you've had the main course. But think about it. Sony's always been a forward thinker. They don't just react to the present, they plan for the future. Sure, the PS5's momentum was slowed by the pandemic, but the world has mostly moved on. Sony isn't looking back, they're positioning themselves for what comes next. And let's be real, the gaming industry is fiercely competitive. Microsoft, Nintendo, and countless others are constantly innovating. Sony can't afford to sit still. Launching the PS6 isn't about abandoning the PS5, it's about making sure they're ready to lead the next wave of gaming. Think of it as planting seeds for a tree you'll enjoy for years to come. The bigger picture, Sony's resilience. Here's what we shouldn't forget. Sony has stumbled before. Remember the rough launch of the PS3? People thought they were out of touch, overpricing their console and losing ground to competitors. But they learned, adapted, and came back stronger with the PS4. Let's not write off an entire brand because of a few bumps in the road. Gaming is a long game, and Sony's been playing it masterfully for decades. Who knows? The best might still be yet to come. What do you think? Isn't it fascinating to see how they're